Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, so um, if you weren't here uh, last week, we started this series, uh, as I said, on different approaches to um, Vipassana practice particularly masters that uh, are written up in Jack Kornfield's book, which is now called Living Dharma. This is the earlier version, Living Buddhist Masters, where he took 12 different masters from mostly, I think they're all from Thailand or Burma, and gave a little bit of an introduction about who they are and their practice approach, and then had their their words or essays by them or uh, questions and answers. Um, so it's seeing all these different styles. And last week we started, as the book does, the first chapter with Ajahn Cha, who was Jack's teacher and uh, Ajahn Sumedho and Ajahn Amaro's teacher. And uh, first want to check in and see if people have been working with with that practice. This is one of the ideas that will, besides just hearing the practice here, how can we apply this during the week? Ajahn Chah, for people who weren't here, the essence of it, I didn't say this last week, I meant to, his whole practice approach in this very pithy statement, let go a little, you'll have a little freedom. Let go a lot, you'll have a lot of freedom. Let go completely, you'll have complete freedom, and your troubles with the, the world will come to an end. You don't, you don't need much more after that. Right? <laughs> but um, I just wanted to see how many people did play around at all with these practices. Good. And uh, anyone, uh, anyone wants to share anything valuable that they've gotten from exploring it? My practice was I'm struggling with sleep deprivation. I have a eight-month-old baby who's not sleeping <laughs> during the night, and I have been really struggling with feeling tired and really um, making a whole drama around it and getting really angry. And and so that was my practice. I wanted to make that my practice this week, and I. Um, and I saw as I tried to relax into being tired and just, I mean, being tired without anything else, mm -hmm. I saw that actually um, it reflected on in, in my baby also, and mm -hmm. she, she calmed down more quickly also. Mm -hmm. And so the more drama I made, the more she was like totally upset. And I was like, this is just the best teacher I can... Uh, I can imagine. So anytime, I mean, I get really upset, I I have to keep that in mind that oh. I'm not doing it only for myself, but also for her. Beautiful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Anyone? Anyone else? All right. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, here's somebody. So what I realized this week is that I could really feel the the tension in my mind. I could feel it first in my body. And so if I could uh, notice it in my body first and then just remind myself to let go in the experience, whatever was going on, and feel that release in the body, I would then notice the release in, in my mind. It would just flow with it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I played with that all week. And how did you uh, remember? Was there any way you'd remind yourself to relax? Or? Well, just actually the mantra of release in experience, that would come up. That was something that just kind of organically came out of it. So. Mm -hmm. so you'd feel your body a bit contracted, and then you'd just remind release in the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 
it's amazing how all we need to do is somehow remind ourselves what we what we know. That's what all of this practice is about. It's like, yeah, just let go. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. While you're in the middle of it, though, it's so hard. So the more you practice, the more available it becomes that you you that synaptic connection in your brain. If you can get it wired up, this is what I think is really a secret to practice, something you might have in your mind. If you can get it wired up, ooh, I'm really starting to lose it. Time to breathe. Or time to just relax or let go. Or time to just feel my body. If you can have that connection, not, oh my goodness, I'm really losing it now. This is awful, blah, 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 and then you're down the road. Just, oh, I'm really starting to lose it. Oh, there's another way. Come back to my breath. Come back to myself. That's what 5, 10, 20 years of practice will do to just make that connection stronger. So, thank you. Okay. So, tonight we'll be doing, uh, we'll be exploring Mahasi Sayadaw, who um, is, along with Ajahn Chah, the other main lineage holder for what goes on at Spirit Rock. Uh, the teachers uh, often teach in Mahasi Sayadaw's style of practice. And not just at Spirit Rock, but throughout the Theravadan world, he's had a, a very major influence on practice. He was born in 1904 in northern Burma, north of Mandalay, Shwebo. And he studied at a monastery that was called the Mahasi Monastery, and he became known as Mahasi Sayadaw. He started out as a scholar starting his studies at the monastery at the age of six or so. And then at about 12, he started, he became a, a novice. And at 19, he uh, went for full ordination. He lived, he died, he died the day before I was married, August 14th, 1982. I remember because that was the big news. This is weird. Mahasi side of that. So, um, so he lived uh, just uh, for 78 years old. And he, uh, he, so he was this scholar, this Pali um, scholar, uh, went f- past his government exams in Pali and, and uh, scholastic uh, Buddhism. Imagine our government having exams in, in Pali and uh, imagine this is what Burma was like. It was great news, by the way. Did you hear on An- Sang Suu Kyi? Uh, is going to be meeting with people tomorrow for the first time in three years. Her supporters and their, um, and she's she's opened up some possibilities of some talks with the uh, people in charge over there. It seemed a bit encouraging. Let's hope so. And uh, he uh, studied, among other things that he was just, that he studied deeply when he studied the Satipatthana Sutta he got very intrigued that this course on mindfulness, he'd been studying for years and years, and then he started to get, maybe there's something I should find out here about what what this this course is about. So he went to study with this um, meditation master, Mungun Saidao, and he quickly progressed, had some very good karma, and... um, really got what the practice was about and then became a teacher not only of Pali but of meditation. As I mentioned last week, most of the monks in Southeast Asia are scholar monks and only 5% are meditators. So uh, he became this great teacher. He was invited by the prime minister to come down to Rangoon to head this big meditation center that was being built, uh, which is, I 
think it, maybe it's called now Mahasi Center. It used to be called Patanayekta. I, I was there. Uh, I spent a little time there. And uh, this was like the major center in, uh, in Rangoon. Imagine the prime minister saying, we want you to come and lead this center. And there have been hundreds and hundreds of Mahasi centers throughout Burma and Thailand and Sri Lanka uh, since. So a couple of other things about his life. Uh, in 1956, he had the very important role. There was the World Buddhist Council that um, celebrated the 2500th year uh, anniversary of the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching, starting teaching. Um, supposedly that was the anniversary. And they had this council inviting Buddhists from all over, not just Theravadan Buddhists, actually, uh, some Mahayana Buddhists. And he got a lot of Mahayana practitioners and teachers interested in the Theravadan teachings um, through that council. And he was the chief questioner at that council, which meant it was up to him to clarify and preserve the teachings. What, what exactly did the Buddha teach? You know, when you're the person asking the questions, you steer the conversation. So this is a, a huge um, and important role. A couple of other things, and we'll get to his practices. He was a, a real innovator. He, in fact, got a lot of criticism because when he taught meditation, feeling the breath as the primary object, instead of doing what's called anapana, anapana means in, out, the breath, the breath, the anapana sati, mindfulness of breathing at the nostrils, he found that it was easier to feel the breath at the belly. And so he made that change. A lot of people saying, that's not, that's not the way. But he was clear, this is what he found helpful. This is what he wanted to teach people. People could do anapana up here as well, but um, this is the primary, if you practice at Mahasi centers, they tell you to watch the rising and falling of the abdomen. And he was another innovator and um, very uh, major impact, I've mentioned this before, in that instead of the traditional way of developing strong concentration for some time before one switches to Vipassana, focusing on some energy centers or using one of a number of concentration objects and developing these absorption concentration states that then you apply that strong concentration to noticing changing experience. You go from concentration to insight. When it was that approach, one had to devote a lot of time because concentration takes time usually. And one basically had to become a monk, uh, a monastic, in order to practice. But he said, no, you don't have to develop that level of concentration. You can have enough concentration so that your mind isn't wandering all over the place. And if you've done retreats at Spirit Rock, you might know it's actually possible. It's not just a good idea. It's actually possible to settle down and start to land in the present moment. For most people, it takes, oh, three, four days where you're just starting to come in for landing and there's stretches of mindfulness. But if you sit for a week or two, you will definitely be a bit quieter than when you came. And so he said you can start with just enough concentration to then notice changing experience, which is what um, Vipassana practice does, which is where the liberating insight is. And he would uh, talk about this as moment-to-moment -moment concentration what's called kanika samadhi, where instead of focusing on one particular thing, you're noticing this moment, now this moment, now this moment, now this moment, and it can be on changing experience, but there's a continuity of awareness that develops its own kind of 
um, samadhi concentration. Um, there are a number of um, students of Mahasis that have had great influence. One of the uh, most famous in the last couple of decades is Upandita Sayadaw, who wrote uh, this book, or there's a compilation of his teachings called In This Very Life. Upandita, as I've mentioned before, is like, you know, just full on turn up the jets, heroic effort. He's the guy, abandon all concern for the body as you sit there. And it's a very um, fierce, full on commitment to practice. But that wasn't the only way that Mahasi, Mahasi disciples taught. One of Mahasi's other great Dharma heirs was Anagarika Manindra or Manindraji. And somebody who I mentioned here before, Manindraji was Joseph Goldstein's teacher and um, was a teacher of mine and uh, a number of, uh, of other Western teachers who had a whole different approach to practice than the Upandita one, which I honor tremendously. I, I, that practice is very, very powerful. But Manindraji would just say, simple and easy. Sounds a lot better, huh? And uh, just empty phenomena falling, uh, rolling on, settle back into the experience. And Manindraji, as I mentioned, is a, is a is a real benefactor to all of us because that approach was so accessible and was what really uh, was Joseph's style of practice. He was also a teacher to Deepama, and so Deepama studied with Manindraji and Mahasi. Um, there was um, in Sri Lanka Godwin Semervaratna at Kandi, uh, at Kandaboda, a wonderful teacher uh, who I have a Good fortune of meeting. Ajahn Asaba was somebody in Thailand who Jack studied with. He was a Mahasi teacher. And when Jack, after he, he left Ajahn Chas for a while and studied at, in Thailand with Ajahn Asaba, and he did the Mahasi style and got uh, found it very helpful. Also, um, well, that's probably enough for now. Ajahn, uh, I mean, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw, a serious guy. Yeah. And uh, the first time I, I met him, which was in 77, we w uh, some of us went to Burma on this uh, it was quite extraordinary, this trip. And he was like a rock. Uh, or y you didn't see a whole lot of emotion. And in fact, when uh, when he would smile or he'd start to smile, there's a custom that um, the, these great teachers have a big Bodhi leaf uh, straw fan. He'd put his fan up to to cover, you know, because you don't have a you don't have a smile just like that. And he blows himself and then put it down. So he was a kind of daunting figure. In fact, I, I kind of wondered, he was supposed to be a fully enlightened being, supposed to be an arhat, actually. Who knows? But saying, wow, well, is this is where it's leading to? I don't know. <laughs> but fortunately, the following uh, week or two, we went and visited Ajahn Chah, who laughed all over the place. And I said, okay, I can, I can do this practice. Um, and Mahasi's... Uh, method of practice also um, followed or was very aligned with what's called the Visuddhi Magga or path of purification where you go through different stages of development, different stages of insight which if you read can be a kind of discouraging if you think, well, wait, I I don't know if I got to that one or that one. You can, you can really mess yourself up, actually, if you know a little bit and you, and you try to compare yourself to the textbook because it doesn't always work according to the textbook. But there is 
often a systematic development over time that is called, and it's one of the, uh, the titles of one of Mahasi's books, The Progress of Insight. Now that can be a tricky title just in itself because we can get very progress oriented. But there is this development uh, of classical stages. And he uh, would guide people using that paradigm. Mm. So practicing in Mahasi style. And we'll do a little bit of practicing here. Um, uh, at Spirit Rock, how many people have done retreats at Spirit Rock? Yeah. Okay, wow, fantastic. How many people have done retreats at anywhere? One more time, I didn't include. Okay, wow, that's very neat. That, wow, I'm really happy. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. If you've done retreats with at, at Spirit Rock, or as most of the teachers share, you, then you know... Usually we start with the breath, a day or two on the breath, just collecting the attention, and then gradually open up to include body sensations and sounds and uh, uh, emotions and thoughts so that there's not anything outside of the meditation, but starting with composing on the breath and gradually developing, widening the field. You go to Mahasi Center, and I just came across in the tapes the Mahasi instructions. You go to the Mahasi Center, and they play a tape for the for new students. There's like hundreds and hundreds of people that come, uh, and all the time they're they're practicing. Like I think when I was there, were like you know 500 or 700 people or so, you know, practicing intensively together, and. Uh, and you go to, uh, and you hear the tape, and they give all the instructions at once. Breath, sensation, sounds, everything. Motions, thoughts. We found it helpful to go a little bit more systematic, because it's really hard to just say, okay, pay attention to everything. But um, he does go over each one and say this is how you would do it. Now one of the main things of uh, the main aspects of his practice is using mental noting. Now this is another thing that he was somewhat of an innovator. In the, in the discourse, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, breathing in, I know I'm breathing in a long breath. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out a long breath. Have being in uh, feeling anger, I know I feel anger. So he's kind of saying, yes, you know this, you, you are aware of this, but Mahasi explicitly said, name your experience. Now for some people, this is a very potent practice tool. For others, it drives them crazy. So it's not to say that this is the only way to do it. But if you have the temperament and can and feel like exploring it, it is a very powerful practice. And I'll say from my own experience, it's what I've done most in my own practice. I am a it's not the only way I practice, but I am a firm believer in the power of mental noting. There are a few things to know about it that I'll share in a moment. But I want to read a little bit first, and we can do different practices as we do, from Mahasi's instructions. Okay. Basic exercise one. Try to keep your mind, not your eyes, on the abdomen. abdomen. You will thereby come to know the movements of rising and falling, the expansion and contraction of this organ. If these movements are not clear to you in the beginning, then place both hands on the abdomen and to feel these rising and falling movements. After a short time, the outward movement of inhalation and the inward movement of exhalation will become clear. Then make a mental note, rising for the outward movement, falling for the inward movement. Your mental note of each movement must be made while it occurs. 
From this exercise, you learn the actual manner of the movements of the abdomen. You are not concerned with the form of the abdomen. What you actually perceive is the bodily sensation of pressure caused by the heaving movement of the abdomen. So do not dwell on the form, but proceed with the exercise. Um, You may be inclined to think, or you might find it difficult to keep the mind on each successive rising movement and falling movement as it occurs. In view of this difficulty, you may be inclined to think, I just don't know how to keep my mind on each of these movements. Then simply remember that this is a learning process. The rising and falling movements are always present and therefore there's no need to look for them. With practice, it becomes easier for the beginner to keep the mind on these two simple movements. So let's just do this for a few moments. We'll do a few things if time permits. And just sit here and if you can feel the rising and falling all on its own, fine. If it helps to put your hand on the belly, then you can do that. And as you sit here, let everything else be in the background and just With each rising, note very softly, rising. With each falling, falling. And continue that. We'll do that for a few moments. Okay, you probably are quite familiar with that. It's interesting, by the way, just as I hear myself saying all those words and then a few moments of quiet and just coming back to yourself. Oh, yeah. Hey, 30 seconds, that's not hard to do. <clears throat> it's after the 30 seconds that it starts getting hard. Okay, basic, that's the basic exercise one. Basic exercise two. While occupied with the exercise of observing each of the abdominal movements, other mental activities may occur between the noting of each rising and falling. Thoughts and other mental functions, such as intentions, ideas, imaginings, are likely to occur between each mental note of rising and falling. They cannot be disregarded. A mental note must be made of each as it occurs. For instance, if you imagine something, you must know that you have done so and make a mental note imagining. If you simply think of something, mentally note thinking. If you reflect, reflecting. If you intend to do something, intending. If you you hear a cell phone, note hearing. Okay. When the mind wanders from the object of meditation, which is the rising and falling of the abdomen, mentally note, wandering. Now here's an interesting piece. Should you imagine you're going to a, should you imagine you're going to a certain place, mentally note, going. When you arrive, <laughs> arriving. When in your thoughts you meet a person, note, meeting. Should you speak to her, him or her in your mind, note speaking. If you imaginatively argue with that person, arguing. <laughs> so forth. That's a very interesting, um, interesting one because uh, I, I find that a little bit tricky because you can get so into your dream that there you are. Yes, I'm being mindful. <laughs> so for the purposes of practice as we teach it, as I 
share it. It's just either knowing thinking or if it's a particular kind of thought like, you know, planning or judging and that's helpful. That's not in the story. That's, that's generally how we do it. But I just thought I'd share that with you. If you intend to swallow while less engaged, make a mental note swallowing. Oh, sorry. Make a mental note intending. While in the act of swallowing, swallowing. (laughs) If you intend to spit, spitting. Then return to the exercise of rising and falling. Suppose you intend to bend the neck, intending. In the act of bending, bending. When you intend to straighten the neck, intending. In the act of straightening the neck, straightening. So it starts to get a little bit more and more complex. Here's... Ah, okay. Should an itching sensation be felt in any part of the body, keep the mind on that part and make a mental note itching. Do this in a reg- regulated manner, neither too fast nor too slow. When the itching sensation disappears in the course of full awareness, continue with the exercise of noting rising and falling. Should the itching continue and become too strong and you intend to rub the itching part, be sure to make a mental note intending. Anytime you're about to move, you, you note the intention beforehand. Um, slowly lift the hand, simultaneously noting the action, the action lifting and touching when the hand touches the part that itches. Rub slowly in complete awareness of rubbing and so on. It must be stressed that the mental note must not be forced nor delayed, but made in a calm and natural manner. The pain, if you feel pain, may eventually cease or increase. I just jumped to the part where there might be some pain or discomfort. Don't be alarmed if it increases. Firmly continue the contemplation. If you do so, you will find that the pain will almost always cease. But if after time the pain has increased and become almost unbearable, you must ignore the pain and continue with the contemplation of rising and falling. This is for your stuff. Yeah. About the purpose of the noting. Yeah, I will in a moment. I'll just uh, want to give you a, a little bit of a... Suppose you are thirsty and, and while you're meditating and you go to get a drink of water. When you look at the water faucet or pot, be sure to make a mental note looking, seeing. When you stop walking, stopping. When you stretch the hand, stretching, etc., etc. It goes all the way, every single moment. Okay, so now... Why do this? The mental noting works in a few different ways. And I should say that when you do the mental noting, it's not that you are mostly focusing on the word. Actually, the word is about 5% and it, the actual experience is 95%. So, If you're lifting, it's like you're feeling the lifting and the word is just a whisper. What does the mental noting do? For one thing, it gives the mind something to do that is directly connect, that is connected to your actual experience. If you are noting, you have to be present and recognize what's actually going on. You can't note and, kind of, and think, yeah, I was kind of, uh, you can't, um, yeah, you can't note and think, oh, I'm kind of here. If you're noting, you are connected to the experience. There might be thoughts going on in the background, but in order to recognize it, it keeps you here. So it's something that occupies the mind that's in the service of awareness. Another way that it works If you do this, if you have the temperament or willingness to try it, and you are noting throughout, this is not just in the sitting, but throughout your meditative day, the continuity of awareness will dramatically deepen. 
It's not that, oh, well, yeah, I was here for that sitting, and then I went for some walking, and I was kind of there for the walking, and then I... It's the transitions in between where there's no breaks and continuity of awareness is the key to deepening concentration. So when I do retreat practice, at first it seems like it's, it is effort. But after a while, and I've been doing this for many years, it's like, the mind just clicks into automatic and it's hard to not note. Or when you don't note, if you, it's like you might be walking and then all of a sudden like a few frames of the movie just kind of vanished. Where was I? And you realize, oh, I wasn't here for the last 10 seconds. That's very different than, oh, I was here for 10 seconds. It's like that continuity of just naming everything. And it gets to be this, if you can do it like a game, that's, for me, what works. It's like, oh, let's see. You know, reaching, touching, pulling, unscrewing, squeezing, putting, putting, brushing, 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 brushing. You do that through the day, your mindfulness will get very strong. Like I say, for some people it drives them crazy, but if you can do it and make it like a game, it's very profound. Another way that the noting works, it notices, you can see your relationship to the experience by the tone of the note. So if you're noting and you're noting thinking, thinking, or judging, judging, damn it, judging, it's kind of in there subtly, you see your relationship is not a healthy one. But by changing the tone, you can actually change your relationship to experience. And as I've, I've done this with, uh, with people on retreats, and probably here I've done it a few times, for me, a big part of my own practice was about two years just seeing judging with a compassionate tone. Just oh, judging, judging. That shift of tone is the difference between contraction, suffering, or developing compassion. When you're very clear and, the, and you start to really, when it starts to kick in, the words can't keep up, actually, with what's going on. So at some point, the words might fall away because there's so much happening. As the, as the concentration develops and the perception and um, uh, refinement of awareness becomes sharper, you can't, you just can't use, you can't name everything. And so at that point, you fall, it falls away. You don't have to keep the notes going. It's just, if you find that you're not really there, it makes a huge difference. Where it's very helpful is particularly, and in helpful both in retreat and in one's daily practice, or going around in one's daily life, is with mind states. Because it's so easy to get caught in the mind state but if you can name the mind state, oh, freaking out. That's what's going on. Freaking out, freaking out, you know. The awareness of the mind state is not caught in the mind state. That which is aware of freaking out is not freaking out. So it's like you become the awareness that's knowing rather than the story. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you can even just name your mind state, as Jnanapanika says in uh, Power of Mindfulness, Jnanapanika Tara, he's, uh, he, I've mentioned this before, it's like in mythology, when the, when the demon or the monster, when their name wasn't known, they have tremendous power. But when the hero or the heroine 
finds out the name of the demon, what happens? They lose their power. It's exactly the same with awareness. When you name that mind state, oh, fear, that's what's going on. Sadness or whatever it is. It's like you're shining the light of awareness on it and you're not caught or stuck in it. So, that's... It's good. It's really powerful. Another way that it works is that you see that in every moment there's the experience and the knowing of the experience. So you see this mind-body process. There's seeing, there's, you see a person, and then there's knowing that you're seeing a person. And that starts to deconstruct the sense of self because you start seeing there's this mind-body process. There's lifting the foot and knowing lifting the foot. I don't know if, if this doesn't compute. You just let it go. But it starts to be very profound. There's a deconstruction of self that happens. Mm. So I'd like you to, uh, let's just play around with this okay, for a little while. And uh, I like to do con- sometimes continuous rhythmic noting where it's, you're not jumping on experience, but just it's kind of like uh, hmm, the image I have, if you're, if you're old enough, they used to have this program, Sing Along with Mitch, where they, and where sometimes they do it on commercials where there's words, the lyrics underneath, and there's a bouncing ball. It's like that. That's how I do the mental noting. It's just a very consistent light touch that is making contact one moment after another in an interval that really is restful but connected for you. Okay, So just um, close your eyes for a moment. Let the mind be relaxed. And you can start by noticing the rising and falling of the abdomen. You might note rising, falling. And then whatever else arises in your experience, note it in a very soft but connected way. Just for the fun of it. If you get lost, you can always either come back to the rising and falling or whatever else is happening in that moment. You can note wandering and then come back if you like. Your mind be very relaxed. You're not pouncing on experience. Relaxed, but enough alertness to connect. Make it like a game.
just uh, check in. Um, any comments, any questions? We're, we're gonna, getting close to the end. Just, uh, yes. Your concentration improved dramatically with the rising and falling, with noting rising and falling? And, okay, so he was aware of other thoughts, but he just focused on the rising and falling. And that's, that's fine. You can play this in any number of ways. It's not like you've got to pay attention to everything. Sometimes you just want to focus on the rising and falling. At other times, you want to open up the field. Either way is really fine. So it's just getting a sense of what will support you being present in the moment. Either way is fine. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. I have a question. How do you apply this when you're having a conversation with somebody? Mm. Yeah. You're trying to get your story out or your ideas. Right. And then what happens in the head? Yeah. Well, it's, it's hard to be going talking, talking, and you're having a conversation. It's true. So this is, or reading, that's another one. Reading, reading, <laughs> reading. You know, it, 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 won't, it won't get in there. So what this is, is actually a training ground, a training exercise to get you here. And you don't, you're not doing this in the middle of conversations, but as you're doing it, as you're more here, say in that retreat, intensive retreat environment, it's like you're sharpening the awareness and learning how to be here more. Where it really can be applied, and one thing I would encourage you this week, two things you can, uh, that come to mind to experiment with. You might just take an activity, like for me, shaving for many, many years has been a mindfulness practice. And I'm actually often saying, shaving, shaving, just to kind of come back here. You might take an activity, you know, washing the dishes or doing some routine and see what it's like to just name what's going on. It's very grounding. Or as you're walking down the street, just, oh, walking, walking, walking. And so that's one way when you're on your own, play like that. Another way, like with Ajahn Chah, like uh, it was said, okay, just when you remember you can relax. Well, try this one. When you're starting to get caught up, just name in a very kind tone what's going on. Oh, fear or confusion or whatever it is and see what it's like to name it and not be in it. Mm. So those are the practices that I would, I would recommend. And when you sit, see what it's like. Experiment with the mental noting. There's one, there's one other aspect that I use with the mental noting that's very, for me, I find very powerful which is in between breaths, there's usually a space. There's often a gap in between the out breath and the next in breath. So when I'm noting, sometimes I do this in my daily sitting. I'm noting, here, you just try this. Close your eyes and feel the rising and falling. And then if there's a space between the falling, just notice yourself sitting here. And so you might note rising, falling, sitting, or rising, falling, touching, feeling the touch sensation. So you're not hurrying the next breath along. If you're used to watching the breath at the nostrils, you might notice the lips touching in between, so it might be in, out, touching, in, out, touching. Okay. 
It can be a great aid in your daily practice if you play around with the, the noting. Okay, there was one other, one other uh, hand. Yes. Here, hold on. I, I find what helps is uh, remembering the past and just the imagery associated with um, playing handball or um, a teacher um, talking to me or um, getting teased by a by a friend, you know, and like um, I had a friend who used to call me Kentucky Fried Alex, and <laughs> because I was a little fat when I was a little kid, and it was so much, and it was hurtful at the moment. But when I thought about it and I traced it back, it was it felt really, it felt fun. So what, when you were just meditating this, uh, when you that those images and memories come up. Yeah, and um, while I was um, imagining it, I was able to focus um, at what you were saying at the same time. Uh huh. Well, when images or memories come up for the purposes of this style of practice, you just note remembering. Or you might note if there's feelings that come up, you know, anger or sadness or whatever. So you're not getting into the story, but you're noticing the actual experience in the moment. It's very, very common for memories to come up like that. Okay, so um, we've got to stop. Uh, Just to know, this can get very exquisite. I was once uh, with Upandita, and he gave three talks, an hour each evening for three successive evenings, about what it's uh, the process of the ending of the sitting, the bell rings, and getting up to start your walking. Three hours he spoke about that process. So you can get very, very refined and detailed about it. And if you make it like a game, if it's just this fun exploration, it's a very potent practice. And as I was just getting into this talk, I was feeling so much gratitude for Mahasi Sayadaw. the, the effect that he's had on the Dharma in the West is, is immense. So um, I pay my respects to him and, um, and all the people who've learned from him, who've taught us as well. Here's a picture, by the way, of um, Mahasi Sayadaw with Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, and uh, Jacqueline uh, Schwartz Mandel when they uh, when he came to Insight Meditation Society in I think this is seventy nine or so and was it gave them formal kind of transmission that they were uh, qualified to teach. So um, let's uh, take a moment and share our blessings. Feel your good heart. Know it. Breathe in and out. May I wake up to the truth. May I see through confusion. May I feel the love that's inside and share it well. And then sending loving kindness out to all beings everywhere, including the people in Burma, Mahasi's homeland, people all over the world, as I want to be happy, may all be happy. May all see through confusion and fear. May all wake up to their true nature. May all share their love well. And may our coming together be of benefit to all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. Thank you. Next week, by the way, we'll get to a lesser known but very intense master, Sunlun Sayadaw. I guarantee you won't be falling asleep during Sunlun practice. Um, 
and it's fun. Have a good week. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.